my name is Noah Rose, and I want to talk to you about marine worms. When I was a little kid, I used to go fishing with my dad. And when we'd go fishing, we'd use these little worms for bait that they just terrified me. They had these little legs running all up and down the sides of them, and these jaws that they could stick out, and they'd try to bite you while you were putting them on the hook. So fast forward to this summer when I'm working as a field assistant studying insects in Maine. After work, me and some of the other researchers would go out and go fishing, and we used the same worms for bait. I was still a little bit terrified from, you know, remembering them from when I was little. And of course, everyone else made fun of me. Which especially makes sense when you consider that one of them was this guy. Hi, I'm Kevin Duclos. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maine, and I study marine worms. Kevin was nice enough to talk to me a little bit about what makes marine worms interesting and unique. Many species of marine worms are most easily distinguished by their parapodia. Uh, parapodium is just a um, form of a leg. Uh, some, some forms have it reduced and they may look more like what you're used to seeing in an earthworm, but in some such as the nereus, what we see here, you'll see very well developed lobes and they use them for swimming and for crawling and actually in reproduction they get highly modified for swimming and you'll see large modified parapodia. But although marine worms may look alien, many species are just the marine equivalent of their close relatives, the earthworms, a relationship readily verified by Florinda down at Marine and Auto Savings in Providence, Rhode Island, who for mid-sized fish recommends marine worms and earthworms for bait. Saltwater and fish well. Although for larger fish, like stripers, she recommends eels. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kevin's work in Peter Jamar's lab at the University of Maine doesn't focus on the relative deliciousness of worms and eels, though. He instead studies their role on the seafloor. They are important in sediment mixing. Just like the movements of earthworms are important in maintaining rich and healthy soil. Like in this compost pile, where by crawling through the soil and eating and excreting the stuff in it, the worms mix in nutrients and gases that living things need. Kelly Dorgan, a previous student in the Jamar's lab, found a way to study how marine worms burrow and the effects of their movements by using gelatin as a substitute for mud. It's really interesting to watch. So my project will follow up on this and I'm looking specifically at the area of bioturbation. So what, what does it mean when they mix the sediment? How does that affect microorganisms? How does that affect the sediment? How does it affect the water quality? Bioturbation is an important part of what happens to living things when they die in the ocean. They settle to the bottom and sink into the mud on the seafloor. There, bacteria eat the dead flesh, and the most successful ones digested by breathing oxygen in from their surroundings and releasing carbon dioxide, which they get from whatever they're digesting. This carbon dioxide is, in turn, what plants and algae breathe in during photosynthesis to build their structures, which form the base of the whole food web. But there's a problem. Here's Jeremy Rich, a microbial ecologist. That can only happen in the very top layers of the sediment where, where oxygen is penetrating, because it's consumed very rapidly. Once the organic matter gets below that zone, it breaks down less efficiently. Here's where the marine worms come in. They mix the sediment and expose matter to oxygen, which stimulates decomposition by these bacteria. In a sense, what these, these animals are doing through bioturbation is increasing the efficiency of the release of CO2 back to the atmosphere. Another instance in which mixing by worms has played an important role happened way back in time, 500 million years ago. And it has to do with gypsum, better known as the stuff that drywall and plaster of Paris are made of. Gypsum is made out of calcium, sulfate, which is just sulfur and oxygen, and water. When there's enough calcium and sulfate in the water, gypsum forms impressive structures. There's a particularly large amount of gypsum, though, that was formed within the last 500 million years like these mountains, which are made almost entirely of gypsum. Which brings us to a new type of bacteria. These bacteria don't breathe oxygen. Instead, they breathe the same sulfate that gypsum is made of. They turn this sulfate into sulfide, buried in the mud on the seafloor, which cannot turn into gypsum. These bacteria may have played a role in the Earth's history in stopping gypsum from being formed. But the evolution of marine worms 500 million years ago may have shaken things up. By mixing the mud, the worms were exposing the stored sulfides to oxygen, turning them back into sulfates, which may have led to the formation of massive amounts of gypsum, which we can still see today. Which highlights the significance of marine worms as a group. They're much more than just a couple of individuals stirring up a beaker. The huge number of marine worms acting the same way around the world can do incredible things. 
They maintain the cycling of the basic building blocks of life, and they can bring about the formation of whole mountains worth of minerals. On top of all that, they have the ability to scare children bonding with their fathers worldwide with their little legs and their terrifying jaws. Thanks to Jed DeMoss, Eli Shear, and Shay Selix for their help filming. Thanks to Sophia Tintori for all her advice. Thanks to Donald Canfield and James Farquhar for figuring out the gypsum stuff. Thanks to my brother Ian Rose for explaining it to me and for his photographs. Thanks to Jeremy Rich. And thanks to Kevin DeClos and the Jamars Lab. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>